you have any questions? All right, there was one question that said, well, if this is a vector and this is a vector, um, what about the sizes? If, if R is a vector because it has the, uh, the longitudinal control, the lateral control, the pedal control, and also the thrust, the throttle basically, there are four controls. You have maybe four surfaces, but the states, there are eight states. So how does the number in terms of matrices and vectors all match? Well, you will see it in this class. I mean, it's not always very straightforward where you have three controls, three outputs, and all that. It might be a little complex. Sometimes the matrices are not square matrices. And you need to do other tricks in order to make it work. So that's why uh, we have this course, OK? Um, all right, let's start with um, a quick review in linear algebra, all right? Uh, as I said, this is on the web, so I will rather go quick in the obvious cases and if I want to make a comment I will take a longer time all right so let's read through this very quickly vector spaces there's something called vector spaces okay all the real numbers and uh, all the um, the world we live in actually the world of numbers and vectors um, we realize it or not they are really vector spaces if you read through it you will understand the definition is that a vector space V is a set of objects called vectors for which operations of vector addition and scalar multiplications are defined. So there's a set of vectors for which the addition, you can add them and you can multiply it with a scalar, the vectors. This sounds very obvious because we usually live here, the three dimensional real numbers Obviously, we have vectors, we add them, we multiply them. If you take the opposite, if you take the vector in the opposite direction, that will be like a subtraction, right? So a line like a real number, right? That would be a vector space. If you live in two dimensions, that's another vector space. You have vectors in two dimensions, right? In three dimensions, that's another vector space. And if you are uh, working in the field of mathematics, you will see there are a lot of vector spaces which are probably not as obvious as these three, okay? But this is what we call vector spaces. Now here's, here, here, why this is important will come in a minute, but in a vector space the following has to be satisfied for x and y being vectors, c1 and c2 being scalars. So x plus y is equal to y plus x, okay? These are things that we use all the time but I just have it written down over here. Okay, what else? X plus Y plus Z is equal to parenthesis X plus Y plus Z. There's a unique zero vector that satisfies X plus zero is equal to X for all X, where X is a vector. For each X, there's a unique vector minus X, such that X plus minus X is equal to zero. One plus X is equal to X. C1, C2 times X is equal to first multiply with C2 and then with C1. C X plus Y is equal to C X plus C Y. C1 plus C2 X is equal to C1 X plus C2 X. Sounds very obvious. As I said, we live in the world of uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional real numbers. So therefore, uh, for us, it looks quite simple. But as I said, mathematically, there are a lot of vector spaces where it is not this obvious. All right? Good, so that's a vector space. Now there's also something called a subspace. A subspace of a vector space is a non-empty subset that satisfies two requirements. If we add two vectors in the subspace, there's some x plus y remains in the subspace. If we multiply any vector x in the subspace by any scalar c, the multiplication Cx is still in the subspace. So it's basically a little field. Let's say this is our vector space. OK. And we have vectors. We can add them, right? Let's, let's have this. It looks like a two-dimensional vector space, right? We can, we can multiply them. OK. That's a vector space. Now, in this vector space, there might be another space 
where if the vectors are in this subspace, if you add them, you still are in this subspace. If you multiply it with any scalar, you're still here. So basically, there's no way to get out of the subspace by doing by adding and multiplication we cannot get out of the subspace if such an area exists we call it a subspace it is basically a space in a vector space it's a vector space in a vector space okay so a vector space might have multiple subspaces basically you have vectors in the subspace, they live in their little world. You add them, you multiply them, they will never get out of this region. They will always stay in this region. Okay? This is what we call a subspace. So vector space and subspace, two things. All right. Linear dependency of vectors. Quite important. Let V be a vector space, V1, V2, V3, Vm being just vectors. So we have a bunch of vectors, V1, V2, V3, all the way to Vm. And let's say we also have uh, scalars, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and lambda 4. Uh, lambda m and they all exist the vectors exist in a vector space v okay vector space all right so these vectors we would call them linearly dependent if there's a set of scalars with at least one non-zero scalar for which this holds. So basically we are saying if this holds, sorry, m, m is equal to zero. If this holds, we will call vectors linear dependent. So why is that? And uh, the obvious solution for is that all lambdas are equal to zero, right? Lambda 1 is equal to zero, lambda 2, lambda 3, all the way to lambda m, they're all equal to zero. That's the obvious solution, but we are, I'm not talking of that obvious solution, okay? The trivial solution. Well, if at least one of them is non-zero, then I could do, for instance, this. I could say, let's say either, just one of them, let's say lambda 3, sorry, V3 can be written like this, right? It could be written like, you can take this to the other side, it will be minus lambda 1 divided by lambda 3 times V1 minus lambda 2 divided by lambda 3 times v2 minus lambda m divided by lambda 3 is equal to lambda m, okay? Given that, of course, lambda 3 is not equal to 0. If this is true, then you can write this. If this is true, we say v3 is a linear combination of these vectors, right? Because these are scalars, you see? That's a scalar, that's a scalar, and that's a scalar. So I can write V3 as a linear combination of the other vectors. In which case I say V3 is linearly dependent on the rest. Okay, so that's important. Now here's a, here's a good thing. I mean, this, okay, V3 is linearly dependent on this. But often we want to know if there is any linear dependency. You will see later, most of the time, we will say <coughs> you don't want any linear dependency. Which means this one, the only solution to this equation, that's only true if the only solution to this equation <coughs> is this. If this is the only solution, 
then we know these vectors are all linearly independent of each other. Okay? I'm going backwards. Now, if this is true, then, and if I can write this, then I say V3 is linearly dependent on the other vectors. That's linear dependency. Which means there is a solution where not all lambdas are equal to zero, there's a solution for this because if lambda 3 was equal to zero, I couldn't write this, right? So I can write this, and therefore, V3 is a linear combination of these things. If I want that none of the vectors are linearly dependent, then this should only exist when all lambdas are equal to zero. then I call this linearly independent. So here it's written, if the only solution for equation one is lambda one, lambda two, lambda, lambda m is equal to zero, then these vectors are linearly independent. You wanna have linearly independent vectors? Check this. Can you find non-zero lambdas? Yes or no? If you can find non-zero lambdas, then we will call it then, then there is some linear dependency. If the only solution to this equation is this, then it's linearly, then the vectors, all vectors are linearly independent of each other. Okay? Uh, this will be important. Because when vectors are linearly dependent, in terms of the controller, there are things you can do become limited. Okay? Most of the methods that we are going to use will require some sort of linear independence. So we will be checking this, not in this form, but in some other forms. But this is a concept we will be checking if the vectors are linearly dependent or independent. Understand that? OK, this is one of the rather important parts you need to understand in this document. OK, any questions? All right, that's linear dependency. Basis, now we talked about vector spaces, we talked about subspace, we talked about linear dependency, okay? Four, basis. V1, V2, V3, Vm, these vectors are called a basis for a vector space V if for every V, there is a unique choice of scalars, blah, 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 for which this holds. Basically, what we are saying is, let's choose, I'm just going to make this up now, let's choose three vectors so that every vector, let's call this vector n, in this vector space, can be written as a linear combination of these vectors. <coughs> okay? Choose some, some really fantastic three vectors such that every other vector in the subspace or in the vector space, in this case, I'm sorry, in the vector space, can be written as a linear combination of these three vectors. If you can do that, these, these vectors form a basis. We call it a basis. So every vector in this subspace I can write as a linear combination of these vectors. We call it a basis. Okay? So, can you think of a basis let's say, in a two-dimensional space, just to give an example. I can remove this now. Can you think of a basis? What is a basis for a two-dimensional space? Let's say this is x, this is y, and this is some vector v. Let's call this v1. Let's call this v2. Just giving examples of vectors. Can you imagine two vectors in this vector space such that every vector 
can be written as a combination of those two vectors? What would that be? Hmm? Two zero and zero five. Two zero. What is that? How did you choose them? They need to be orthogonal. Okay, that's all they need, right? Yes. So why don't you choose a simple orthogonal vector? Because choose a simple one. I mean, you already have two orthogonal. <coughs> yeah, choose something like that. This vector, okay. Let's call it this vector. Let's call this one i, and let's call this one j. Every vector in this vector space can be written as a, as a combination of i and j, right? Those vectors have a name. Unit vectors. They're called unit vectors, right? Unit vectors form a basis for this two-dimensional vector space. Because every vector in this two-dimensional vector space can be written as a combi linear combination of the unit vectors. OK? Well, that's the idea. So if I have a three-dimensional space, you might want to find three vectors. Another one. Let's use the same problem. x, y. Here's another one. Can I choose this? I'm just rotating this, and this is now j. Let's say this is 90 degrees. Do these two vectors form a basis for this vector space? Yes, of course. Okay? It doesn't have to be along these um, uh, coordinate axes. They can be, as long as they're 90 degrees, there's no problem they will form a basis because every other vector you can write as a combination of j and i as long as they are 90 degrees. If they are not 90 degrees, that will not work anymore. They will not form a basis. Right? Is that fine? So this is what we call a basis. And this is what we call linear dependence, right? Now every vector on this vector space can be written as a linear combination of, this base, of, of the base vectors. OK? If such a basis exists, V is called a finite dimensional vector space. This is a finite dimensional vector space. What's the dimension of this? Two, right? It's finite dimensional. It's not infinity, because we can find two vectors and with that, we can define everything else. So that tells you the dimension of the vector space. Okay? If there are three of them, we will call it three-dimensional vector space. Sometimes, you cannot find basis vectors. I mean, you, you might probably not have encountered such a vector space because we live in the world of real numbers and two dimensions, three dimensions. But there might be cases where you cannot find such a basis. In that case, we call that vector space an infinite dimensional vector space. Okay? So, in the world that we live in as aerospace engineers and so far in undergraduates, you always were living in the world of finite dimensional vector spaces where we always define nicely a basis to define every vector in our vector space. And we never restrict ourselves to subspaces, we are always in this world. Is that okay? Now this is a little bit looking at things that you already know probably from a different perspective. But this is, this is the language you need to be talking slowly, okay? All right. If V is a vector space with basis this and this, then every basis for V will contain exactly M vectors. The number M is called the dimension of V, which means these two are the base uh, uh, form a basis, these two vectors. If you want to, and these two also form a basis for, for this. So you always need two vectors to do this. You cannot 
form a basis with one vector. If you can do it with two, then every basis that you will form will also have the dimension two. So therefore, the vector space is called a two-dimensional vector space. Okay? So if you want to learn more about this, of course, there are lots of books that will talk about these things. This is, for me, just an introduction now. All right. Matrices and linear systems. Everybody has worked with matrices. Matrices are very instruct, in, interesting objects. You don't even know how to, I don't even know how to put it. Matrices are rectangular arrays of real or complex numbers. In general, matrix of order M cross N has this form. So if you look at this, when I write this A11, A12, A13, A1N, N signifies the number of columns. And if you go down, it will be A21, A31, A41, AM1, and that signifies the rows. Okay? So in this case, we have M rows and N columns. All right? M rows and N columns. So if I write something like this, Call this the matrix has the size of the matrix we call M cross N. Sometimes I would write it here M cross N. I, I would rather like to do that. And it basically says it has N columns, number of columns. And M number of rows. If the rows and the columns are equal, the number of rows and number of columns are equal, obviously the matrix will be a n cross n, okay? And we simply say the matrix is of size n, which means it's a square matrix. This is what we call a square matrix. Because it has M numbers over here, N numbers over here. This is not a square matrix. It will be a square matrix if I have the same number in rows and same number of columns. Okay? So, regardless, I'm sure you know how to add matrices. If you don't, maybe you shouldn't be here. Right? How to multiply a, a, a matrix with a scalar. You basically multiply every... Uh, element of the matrix with <coughs> that scalar. How you multiply them, if you multiply two matrices, it's basically you, you, you uh, multiply the uh, columns with the rows, you add them together and so on and so forth, right? Everybody, I hope, knows how to multiply matrices. The transpose of a matrix is basically making the rows columns and the columns rows, right? That's what we call a transpose. And also in this class, we will show it with a superscript T. That would be uh, the transpose. Some properties of matrices, as I just summarized them over here. I'm pretty sure many of you know those things. But take a look at 5 and 6. This is something that's been sometimes um, uh, confused and we will be using this in the class. These are kind of obvious, but this one here maybe is not. A plus B transpose is equal to A transpose <coughs> plus B transpose, but A times B transpose is B transpose A transpose. Okay? Now if you want to have a proof of this, go to our linear algebra book and look at the proof. But this is something I will be using in this class, so I want you to remember this. All right. Zero matrix, a zero matrix of M cross N 
has all its entries equal to zero and is denoted by zero. So every number in the matrix is zero. A plus zero is equal to zero plus A is A. Identity matrix, it basically has the following property. It, if you multiply it with A, you will get A again. So the identity matrix put it here. So the zero matrix is basically has a bunch of zeros, right? It's quite simple. The identity matrix has a lot of ones and everywhere else it has zeros. But here, this part has all ones in the diagonal. We call this the diagonal of the matrix. So the diagonal has ones. Everything else is 0. So you realize it's, you write a lot of zeros over here. So sometimes in this class, I will be doing this just for shorthand, not to <coughs> write too much. I will just say one, 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 and I will say zero and zero. Okay? It's just because I'm lazy. So if I do this, I just didn't want to write a lot of zeros. Okay? So this means zero, zero here. I, I did this once a few years ago, and one of the students came back and said to me, how is this a matrix? There is one zero here, one zero here, and a lot of ones. And then I, I got embarrassed because I thought it was my fault. I didn't explain it correctly. Um, I didn't blame the student because I'm sure, it, I don't know if it was a he or she. He or she was probably very smart. It's just I didn't explain it well enough. So if I do something like this, there are just zeros everywhere. That's what it means, OK? Don't do it if you write a formal paper or uh, anywhere formal, okay? It's just to save time. Okay, let A be a square matrix of order N. If there's a square matrix B of order N for which AB is equal to BA equals identity, then we say A is invertible. Now, this is important. That is quite important. Let's say you have a square matrix A. OK, it's n by n. All right? And let's say you have another square matrix n by n. If you multiply A with B and you get identity, if you can find such a matrix B, if you can find it, we say A is invertible. A is invertible. Or we say A is an invertible matrix. Okay, A is an invertible matrix because we can find a B such that if you multiply A and B, you get identity. Identity is this one. Okay. It can be shown that the matrix B is unique. There's only one matrix that will satisfy this, but might not always exist. If it doesn't exist, we call A uninvertible or not invertible. B is sometimes denoted as A over minus 1. So we would call it like this. A times A over minus 1, the inverse, is equal to identity. But this, in reality, is just another matrix. Okay, this is just another matrix, and it doesn't even look similar to A at all. This doesn't always exist. If it exists, we call A an invertible matrix. So the matrix A is called invertible if A over minus 1 exists. 
If A and B are invertible, then the following is true. That's again something that I want you to remember. A times B over minus 1 is equal to B over minus 1, A over minus 1. Okay? What is A over minus 1? A over minus 1 is the inverse of A. This is the inverse of B. So that means they are invertible. If you take A times B over inverse, it looks like this. If you want to take the transpose of the inverse, that's interesting. The transpose is equal to the inverse of the transpose. Okay? So which means you first take the inverse and then the transpose, or the transpose, then the inverse, it's, it's, it's the same. Okay? So the matrices have a lot of interesting properties. Who would think of that? Well, that's true. A matrix A is called, first of all, any questions here? This is something we need to understand. Invertible matrix A, that. No? OK. Um, a matrix A is called symmetric if A transpose is equal to A. OK. The matrix A is skew symmetric if A transpose is equal to minus A. All symmetric and skew symmetric matrices are also square matrices. How, is, how do you recognize a symmetric matrix? You will have a diagonal here, right? And if there is a number on each side that will match to the other side, we would call it a square matrix. Because if you take the transpose, it will still be the same. OK? That's what it says. Rank, I'm sure you have heard of rank of a matrix. Okay. Have you heard of it? Okay, good. Let matrix A be of order M cross N, so it doesn't have to be square. Okay? The row rank of A is the number of linearly independent rows. So what does that mean? Linearly independent rows. I think we just made a definition for linear dependency, right? Let's say you have a matrix A. It looks like this. Now, if you look at this, Each row looks like a matrix, that, uh, looks like a vector, doesn't it? I mean, a vector would look like this, right? You could write this as a vector. In fact, if I wanted to write this, so A1 transpose would look like, for the vector now, the transpose would look like this. Right? So I could actually write this probably like this. A is equal to A1 transpose, A2 transpose, A M transpose, right? So each of them is like a vector. So, and we already know what linear dependency for vectors mean. We go back there, right? We know when we say they are linearly dependent, linearly independent, basically, can I write, can I multiply it with a number and write it as a function of the other one? So, the row rank, we are talking of the rows now, of A is the number of linearly independent rows. How many linearly independent rows do I have? Can I write one vector as a function of the other ones? As a linear combination of the other ones, I'm sorry. 
That was the, line, the, the definition of linear dependency, remember? Can I write a vector as a linear combination of the other vectors? If the answer is no, then that vector cannot be written as a function of the other vectors. So how many rows are linearly independent? How many of them cannot be written as a linear combination of the others? That number will give you the row rank. Let's say I have five rows. None can be written as a linear combination of the others. The row rank is five. Right? But one of them, let's say, can be written as a function of the others. So in fact, out of the four, only four of them can be written independent, are independent. So that we will call the row rank is four. You do the same thing for the columns, because they also look like vectors, right? Use the same principle we had for linear dependency and see how many of them are linearly independent. And that will give you the column rank. Number of independent vectors will give you the column rank. So we have two things. We have the row rank, how many of them are linearly independent. We have the column rank, how many of them are linearly independent. We have the column rank. So what is the rank of the matrix? Typically, we say the lower of these two, the lower number of these two, is the rank of the matrix. Okay, so let's say the row rank is 5, the column rank is 6, the rank of the matrix we would say is 3, no, 5, okay, it's the lower one, okay? Just want to make sure you're not sleeping yet. It will get a lot more fun after we go to controls. Yes, sir. Yeah. At the x one you write the you write as a column, but you write the row. Which one? At x one the red one. Yeah. Yes, you write the uh, row as column. No, yeah, that's right. I wrote the row as a column, but then I say transpose, and now I have the row. So uh, when we say x one or x two, it's something we write the uh, row as a column always. Or no, no, no. A vector. This is a vector. A vector always looks like a column. Okay. So if I want to write a row, I will put a transpose and then it becomes a row. I mean, this is still a vector, but the transpose of this one. Okay. No, I take that back. This is not a vector. It becomes a matrix of this size. I mean, you can think of this and this as a matrix with uh, uh, one column and one row. These are two matrices. But if you talk of vectors, it has to look like this. It has to be a column. All right. Yes. Good, how do you check the rank of a matrix? It's not that straightforward. You can just sit down and try to find the linear combination of these things. There's got to be an easier way, right? <laughs> we will talk about some of them now. What, what will it help us? Yeah. You'll see, that's why are, we are in this class. In mathematics, you know, if you take a mathematics class, they will always teach you what a rank is. But then the question is, where do I use it? And in this class, in the automatic control class, in modern control, there are lots of applications of this. If something is not full rank, it will mean something. It will mean that you cannot do certain things. For a method to work, it has to be full rank. Okay? Such things we'll see. And why does it have to be full rank? We will see in the next weeks. Why does it have to be full rank? Why is it not enough if it's not full rank? You know, these are the things we will be looking at. That's why I'm giving this as a, as a start. Right? So the lower number is called the rank of a matrix. Let a, a n cross n, so it's a square matrix, be a square matrix with elements from R, from real numbers basically, and let the vector space be v all elements of R the size of n. Then following our equivalent statements. Now that's now important. The following are equivalent statements. Let me make this bigger. Again, A is n cross n. Okay? Let me start with the important ones. A over minus 1 exists. It means A is invertible. 
We'll talk about the determinant in a minute, but that also means, these are equivalent statements, if this is true, then this is true. Determinant A is not equal to zero. So the determinant of A is not equal to zero. So if the inverse exists, then determinant A is not equal to zero. It also means if determinant A is equal to zero, then A is not invertible. Okay? It also means rank A, if A over minus 1 exists, it also means rank A is full rank. And the matrix A is full rank, which means the rank of A is n, which means it doesn't have linearly independent columns and linearly independent rows. That is only true if the, ter the determinant is not equal to 0. If the determinant is equal to 0, then it's not full rank. Then there's something going on here, and there, and there are either some linearly dependent rows or linearly dependent columns. Okay? So, if you want to check what's the rank of a matrix, that might, might not be very straightforward. However, is, is it a full rank matrix? That's easy to check. All you need to look at is the determinant. Again, this thing. The inverse of A exists. Okay. Does it exist? If it exists, then we call that invertible matrix. But does it exist? And I'm not even asking what it is. I'm not just asking, does it exist? The way to check is, take the determinant and check if it's 0 or not. If it's not equal to 0, then we know B exists, and therefore A is invertible. Okay? So that's why this is so, so great, so important. Sometimes people ask me, what, what do you use determinants for? Well, determinant is an interesting number, of course. It has a lot of properties. But this one property that we are going to use in this class is going to be this, to check if it's invertible, to check if it's full rank or not. What does full rank mean? It means columns and rows are linearly independent. It's perfect, right? There are two more properties. A times x is equal to 0, which means has a unique solution x is equal to 0. The only solution for this is when x is equal to 0. Okay. And here, ax is equal to b, if you want to find x, x has a unique solution for any b. So you put a b over here, x will give you a unique solution. Remember the linear systems where you were solving 3x plus y is equal to 5, 2x plus y is equal to some number, and then find x and y two equations, two unknowns, and the question is always, can I find a unique solution for x and y? You can find a solution for x and y only if A is full rank, therefore the determinant is not equal to zero, and A over minus one exists. Okay? Let me just write it down over here. Just give you an example. 3x plus 5y is equal to 6. I'm just making this up. 2x plus 2y is equal to 5. Is the solution for x and y unique? x, y, unique. OK? Well, you put this, write this in matrix form. It will look like this, right? 3, 5, 2, 2 x, y, 6, 5. OK? And this one will be the A matrix. And this one will be the unknown vector x. Not to confuse it with that x, you want, want to put a z, I don't know. I don't care. All right? Is equal to another vector b. So find z. Is z unique? It depends on this A matrix. If it's full rank, this will be a unique solution. If the determinant of this is not equal to zero, it will have a unique solution. If this is invertible, it will have a unique solution. These are all connected. So what about the determinant of this? 
What is it? Minus? Minus 4. Determinant is minus 4. It's not equal to 0. And therefore, this is invertible. And therefore, this has a unique solution. And this is full rank. There is no linear combination between them, between the rows and the columns. OK? So this document in the, in, on the web will, I think, help you a lot. OK? This is, this is a nice summary. Just have to remember, if something has determined equal to 0, there's a lot of things happening. You can say a lot of things about the matrix. OK? Any questions? Oh, you have a watch over there. I don't see it here. OK, let me do the final definition, then we can have a break. The null space of a matrix A consists of all vectors x, such that Ax is equal to 0, and x is not equal to 0. It is, it, it is denoted by Na. The null space is a subspace. The null space of a matrix A consists of all vectors x that will satisfy this. Just keep it in mind. It's basically a vector that's multiplied with a, and it will give you zero. If you can find that axis, that those axes are called the null space of a. Okay. Null means zero in German. Just so you can remember. Let's give a short break. The next hour, I'll talk about determinants, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and canonical forms.